Update Call. I'm Trey Campbell, Luminar's Vice President of Investor Relations. With me today are Austin Russell, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, and Tom Fenimore, Chief Financial Officer. As a quick reminder, this call is being recorded and you can find the earnings release and slides that accompany this call at luminartech.com forward slash quarterly review. In a moment, you'll hear brief remarks followed by Q&A. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that during the call, we may refer to GAAP and non-GAAP measures in our remarks. Today's discussions also contain forward-looking statements based on the environment as we currently see it, and as such, does include risks and uncertainties. Please refer to our press release and business update presentation for more information on the specific risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially. Before handing it over to Austin to dive into this quarter's business update, I'd like to share a video detailing the next major milestone for our company with our new manufacturing partners, Celestica and Fabernet. Let's roll. When we started the company, we recognized that manufacturing of the product was going to be as hard, if not harder, than the underlying architecture. Taking a sophisticated optoelectronic product like a LiDAR system and deploying it in a high volume, high quality, scaled, low cost environment. Luminar made the decision on the front end that we needed to own that challenge. You simply throw it over the wall to someone else that doesn't have the experience that we do, ultimately it would become a problem. So from the very onset, we were investing in our advanced manufacturing capabilities alongside the product engineering capabilities. It was the ultimate goal of creating the most manufacturable LiDAR in the industry. And that makes us unique in the industry. We've not seen any other LiDAR company really aggressively tackling, owning the hard problem of manufacturability like Luminar has. Here we are at Celestica in Monterrey, Mexico, where the first Iris units are coming off the assembly line. Luminar is super excited to have picked Celestica as our manufacturing partner based on the infrastructure they have here, based on their expertise in building complex products, and also the staff and the team members they have with the right skill levels for building Iris. So here we have our SMT line. This is where we build PCBAs. We have screen printers, solder paste inspection, pick and place equipment, reflow oven, end of line inspection. This line builds PCBAs to automotive quality standards. And that's just one component that goes into the iris sensor, which gets integrated into our clean room in a different part of the factory. So here in the Celestica clean room, we execute all of the process steps to put together the final iris sensor. Those process steps were developed in our advanced manufacturing facility in Orlando, and we copied exactly those same process steps here at Celestica in Monterrey. As part of the setup here at Celestica in Mexico, we have equipment, we have infrastructure, but also very importantly, we have a skilled staff. Part of the process is training that staff. Esta máquina pone la pega para que después ponemos el vidrio encima. Okay, entonces otra vez. We integrate a lot of different components in the sensor. Some of those key components we get from other partners that we work with. One of those partners is Fabernet. Fabernet's expertise is in optical, optoelectronics, microelectronics manufacturing. So they manufacture key parts of our sensor and those assemblies are then delivered here in Mexico for integration into the final product and the final iris. The way this clean room is set up, we actually sequentially follow the number of different process steps that we've developed in our pilot line. And then we go up to calibration and test in our ATP room. So as part of this uh, qualification and calibration and validation room, we have a number of different stations that we're setting up. One of the interesting ones here is reflectance. So with the reflectance station, we actually um, calibrate our ability to see for the sensor to see different grayscale values. So in this case, we have a sensor looking down the line. We have a number of different targets set up down the line that the sensor looks at and we calibrate reflectance. On the other side of this room, we have our long distance calibration.
That's where we look at targets at 200 meters, 350 meters, different distances. And same thing, we calibrate the sensor's ability to look across those different distances. After all the processes in this room, all of the calibrations and validations that we do with the sensor, the sensor leaves this room off to the pack out area where the sensors are packed out and then ready for shipping to our customers. As we achieve success in scaling our manufacturing in Mexico, this gives us the to a much larger part of the global automotive industry and really positions and solidifies Luminar's position in making autonomy both safe and ubiquitous. Today is a defining moment for Luminar in the broader industry. We've launched the inaugural IRIS off the line in Mexico with our newly unveiled series production manufacturing partners, Celestica and Fabernet. There's a lot of implications here, and I'll speak more to this later. We wanted to take a quick moment for a thank you to all of our employees and partners in this heroic effort to get the facility tooled up and online as we continue to iterate. Zooming out, as a recap, last quarter we made the transition from a LiDAR company to a LiDAR-led autonomous vehicle company combining our software with Volvo's autonomous software subsidiary, ZenSAC, as well as partnering with the largest automaker in China, SAIC. We've continued our win streak across the board and look forward to sharing more in the key areas of business for this update call, including team, product, production, and commercial wins. And then jump to our CFO, Tom, who will share some of the company level annual milestones and where we stand on those that, from what we set forth at the beginning of the year. Let's start with the team. You can't overemphasize how critical this is. This is a technology, a product, and an industry that's never existed before, and something that we've been having to pioneer at the tip of the spear. Because even if you have the perfect vision, technology, or product, you need a world-class team to be able to execute, scale, and go to market with commercial wins, and build the critical infrastructure for the business. Two leadership hiring wins that you've probably seen, uh, one of which uh, kicked off the call is Trey, um, who is now leading our investor relations as an executive coming from Intel, and Alan Prescott as our chief legal officer, who is a safety engineer and legal industry leader who led that team and function at Tesla. What isn't as visible is what we've done in parallel across all the teams to accelerate our ability to execute. So far this year, we've already hired nearly 100 additional top-notch hardware and software engineers, supply chain experts, employees, and contractors to execute the back half of product industrialization and preparation for series production. This includes everyone from the chief assisted driving engineer from a top tier one, all the way to bringing on a top industry deal executive to lead our corporate development efforts. Next up, product. So first off is, is with Iris, we've continued to kit our, our key milestones and deliverables with now multiple key partners already running live with Iris as we optimize it for series production. We've also continued to quantitatively hit our key LiDAR performance metrics we promised, not just as numbers on a slide. Our target milestone for the end of the year remains delivering the first C sample, which we remain on track for. Second, from a software standpoint with Sentinel, following into introduction for the last quarter, we've kicked off the next phase of our software development in partnership with ZenSAC at full speed ahead, leading up to the alpha release before year end. We made two key achievements on this front already since the announcement a couple of months ago. You know, one, uh, we successfully collected enough Iris LiDAR data to train and optimize the performance of our perception software, which we've since executed. And two, uh, we've received the, gr the green light from Germany to proceed with Sentinel development and testing on public German roads where our Munich operation is based. This is all only reinforcing our transition to a system level autonomous vehicle company and partner, moving up and beyond the foundation of our life. Next up, production. This area is a key focus for the call with regards to supply chain execution and manufacturing execution on the path to series production. Today, we've achieved the most significant milestone we've had to date when it comes to advancement towards series production. Two leaders in advanced electronics and optics production have partnered with us to scale our product for us to deliver to leading OEMs and beyond. 
And in fact, we've already been working closely together for months to get the initial line up and running in the Celestica facility in Monterey, Mexico. As was mentioned in the video, we pulled it off. Celestica is responsible for product level assembly and fulfillment, while Fabernet assembles some of the core optical components for us. They will both continue to accelerate and de-risk our plans. Just as we pioneered this breakthrough technology, as well as advanced manufacturing process, we pioneered a new manufacturing business model that's the first of its kind. The norm is that OEMs only work directly with legacy tier ones, as they've been working with for decades, and to have a shot, you have to license the technology to those tier ones. Early on, we knew that while that model was easy and appropriate for less complex technologies or products, tier ones had experience with in a prior capacity, we knew that we needed to have ownership over the product, process, and customer end-to-end -end if this was going to be successful. And for the past five years, we've executed exactly to that, retaining 100% ownership over the product, manufacturing process, and of course, the economics and relationship with the automaker. Lastly, when it comes to a commercial standpoint and major commercial wins, we've been crushing it beyond what we could have imagined at the beginning of the year, just a handful of months ago. In Q1, we announced a big leap forward with two major partnerships, first from a product standpoint with Zensac, and second from a commercial standpoint with SAIC. So far in Q2, we've continued to diversify beyond our core OEM business, working with leading players in verticals from aircraft to robo-taxis. The partnership with Airbus' Up Next division marked a significant milestone for Luminar as our first foray into aviation, a nearly $1 trillion industry on its own, and a step in the right direction for the broader automation economy. Earlier this week, we also announced another major commercial win with the largest autonomous car company in China, Pony AI. Since launching their pilot service not long ago, they've driven more than 5 million kilometers across a global operational coverage area in five major cities, providing more than 220,000 robo-taxi rides. Our business in China is certainly off to an incredible start following our kickoff in the region with SAIC just a couple of months ago. So in conclusion, at this stage in our company, Execution is everything. And as you can see, we remain diligently focused on delivering our goals and milestones and have been hitting them accordingly. From a business and execution standpoint, I'm very proud in terms of what we've been able to pull off this past quarter and look forward to taking the industry a step closer to making safe autonomy a reality. Now, I'll hand it over to Tom to review our annual goals and milestones as well as current financials. Thank you, Austin. Our focus for this year remains on achieving milestones that will deliver long-term shareholder value for Luminar in this emerging industry. At the beginning of the year, we introduced five critical milestones to help do exactly that and measure success for this year. Thanks to the great work of the team, our progression so far has us either on track or ahead of schedule to hit each of these milestones. Let's review them one by one. Our first milestone relates to the IRIS industrialization and production plan. This is a multi-step plan, and as Alston outlined, we took a huge step forward with the process transfer to our contract manufacturing partners and bringing them online. The specific milestone is to reach the C sample stage for IRIS by the end of the year, which remains on track. The next annual milestone relates to software and specifically the alpha release of Sentinel by year end. We are continuing to build out perception, proactive safety, and highway autonomy functionality internally and with our partner Zensac. We are on track for this milestone and actually plan to show off some of our capabilities before the end of the year. The third milestone was to win three major commercial programs this year. As Austin mentioned, we've been winning more deals from major players and at a greater pace than anticipated. We expect to increase this guidance during our next earnings call. The fourth milestone was to grow our forward-looking order book by 40% this year. Once again, we anticipate increasing this guidance on our next earnings call. Our final milestone relates to maintaining a strong liquidity profile and cash position with the target to end 2021 with a greater cash balance than where we started the year. In the first quarter, we raised $154 million from redeeming our warrants and had a net cash burn of $29 million, putting us well on track to achieve this milestone. Executing on these five milestones is how we will measure success this year, and the team is off to a great start to achieve 
or beat each of them. Before we progress to Q&A, I'd like to share a few updates with regards to our Q1 financials. While our quarterly financials in the near term are not a good indicator of our longer term profitability potential, we nevertheless continue to execute accordingly and have some good updates. Revenue for the first quarter was $5.3 million, up 120% from the prior quarter. One thing worth noting is that while we recorded a gross loss for the quarter, this is not reflective of our unit economics or long-term profitability, as there are additional and one-time cogs from the initial ramp up of virus production, absorption costs from hydro production ramped down, and development-related expenses related to launching our initial series production program. We've maintained a strong liquidity at the end of the quarter with $610 million in cash and equivalents, and we had approximately 340 million shares outstanding at the end of the quarter. Lastly, we are on track to achieve our 2021 revenue guidance of 25 to $30 million. In closing, I'd love to reiterate my thanks once again for the entire team at Luminar doing a great job during this past quarter. We're off to a great start in 2021, and with that, we'll hand it over to Trey for Q&A. Now, our first question will be from Emmanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so it seems you, you've already got three new commercial programs uh, this year between SIC, Pony AI, and Airbus. Um, am I correct in my understanding? This was the, uh, the guide for the full year. So you're saying it will get um, raised next quarter. How should, how should we understand this? Um, are you expecting additional you know, wins uh, for the year? And in particular, can you provide an update on your uh, pipeline or funnel of opportunity? I think last quarter you were saying you have maybe 14 program opportunities. Um, any update to this number? Sure. Uh, so uh, first, with regards to your, later, uh, to your last question here. So the pipeline still remains at 14. Uh, as we've kind of moved those two additional ones now into the win category, we've replenished them with two additional ones. Uh, quite frankly, with just uh, how much the team is focused on execution and the level of intensity that it takes with each of our customers to convert them from kind of that development category into the win category. Um, I wouldn't expect us to uh, make that number higher than 14 or materially higher in the near term here, just based upon the level of resource constraints that we've had. The second thing I would say is, yes, you're right. Um, so far this year, we've, uh, we've won three major wins. Uh, we are, um, a lot of them just happened recently. So we're taking a look at our current pipeline, uh, having conversations with our customers, um, not only about potential new business, but the business we've already won and the exact programs that they're gonna include in them. And we plan to provide uh, updated guidance, uh, higher guidance uh, at our next quarterly earnings call. And I guess as part of this, um, wh when would you expect traditional uh, volume automakers to make sourcing decisions about uh, LiDAR? It feels like so far, um, not specifically, you know, just for Luminar, but in general, a lot of the sourcing decisions seems to have been either the high-end uh, automakers or robo-taxi, commercial vehicle. Um, um, what's your view on timeline for traditional OEMs? Yeah, so uh, when, when it comes to some of the uh, traditional OEMs, you know, the business has only continued to accelerate, as, as Tom mentioned, for the existing programs that we've been working on. And, um, you know, when it comes to getting designed into the major platforms here, you know, oftentimes uh, it starts with kind of the lead, uh, you know, luxury models and then can expand there on out. And, and th those are the exact kinds of, um, you know, conversations, dialogue that we're having in terms of the scope of how the rest of this plays out and, um, you know, the timeline for the launch of the different uh, models and programs but well uh, when it comes down to it um you know the oem side of this this is this is the the core and the lifeblood of the business that's been driving this forward and sets the schedule for all of this at the end of the day and um there there's there's no slowing down on that so uh for for both existing and um for ultimately uh what what we'll have ahead so that's why uh, all those things considered um as tom mentioned we'd be increasing the guidance next quarter as we um, continue to get these these new data points as uh, from our recent wins and um, uh, things happening later this year. Okay, 
Right. And then maybe just final one. Um, so you now have two major wins in China between uh, SAIC and, and Pony AI. Uh, can you describe the competitive dynamics over there, maybe relative to the US and Europe? Um, are you mainly competing against local suppliers or again, you know, some of the um, uh, US ones? Um, and would a pro I don't know if you're able to comment on this, but for a program like Pony AI, would the pricing be higher given low volume or generally on robo taxis versus um, you know, tr versus traditional automakers? Yeah. So I'll say, uh, you know, generally, um, as kind of a rule of thumb for these programs, people come to us, you know, when, when they're when they're really ready uh, to be able to reach that series production phase, and when they're starting to make that transition out of development, uh, we generally avoid working with kind of earlier stage programs that you know may or may not you know materialize or have a lower likelihood of that, and that's why we try to stick to the the major players that have the resources to really be able to put behind it and see it through. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, and uh, yeah, when when you talk about uh, leaders in their respective fields like SAIC and um, you know even even Pony here, that's uh, that's certainly the case for uh, for China uh, and beyond. W when it when it comes down to it, um, you know that that's where again, you know, there's there's a lot of different approaches that you can take when it comes to the development and testing, but uh, that's the whole point of why we're here and what we're changing. Um, so taking a, a, a holistic step back. Um, yeah, I, th I think we we continue to certainly see that accelerate, and um, as you said, our kind of pedal the metal, and uh, I th this is uh, this is really the start of our operations in China. Great, thank you. Question is from Dustin Scaringe with Baird, and he's on audio only. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. This is Dustin on the line for Tristan. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Sentinel. Um, you know, you received the green light in Germany to develop and test on public roads. I was wondering first if this was a relatively easy process, and then what are the implications for testing and development in other countries? Do you think it will be easy to test elsewhere? And then I have a follow-up. Thank you. Yeah, so so when it comes to Sentinel, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work that we've we've done and put into place. Um, you know, I, I think just a second here. Sorry, just technical adjustment. Um, so when 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 it when it comes to Sentinel, uh, this is where we've continued to be able to focus on the core development of this. You know, there's a lot of work that's left to be done uh, to really be able to to make this happen and and bring this out into into the broader industry. Um, the whole point of what we've been doing. In Germany and in Munich, uh, we actually uh, did an aqua hire of this team uh, from, from Samsung um, previously to be able to accelerate the development of this full stack solution. And of course, you know, recently partnered with with Volvo subsidiary Zensac uh, to be able to accelerate this. Um, we have now really kicked off uh, the actual testing and development on roads. And you know the approval from from Germany was a, certainly an important step in that, since uh, the a lot of the development that's happening there um, is really being realized and tested in Germany itself. Um, and that's where uh, we are, are, of course, having a global scope of the overall deployment. Um, but uh, testing and validation is a critical part of all of these processes. And uh, for for the until it's actually production ready, you know, you need to be able to have permission to do that. Got it. Okay. Um, and as a follow-up, I was wondering if you guys can talk a little bit more about Airbus up next and your partnership there in more detail. Um, what vehicles do you think your LiDAR sensors will be placed on? What problems are they solving? And then finally, you know, given that solving the autonomy problem in cars and trucks already is hard enough, how feasible do you think LiDAR is in flight given that they travel at you know, similar speeds and completely undefined environments. Yep, yep. So it's funny. in some ways, the autonomous flying problem is, is easier uh, in the sense that um, there are a lot fewer obstacles that you know, you'll necessarily encounter in flight. Um, at the same time, it's, it's more difficult in the sense that you need to have uh, a critical level of reliability that, to be achieved to be able to make this uh, safe and autonomous. And that's really the whole point of what we're enabling is to be able to better enable autonomous flight on everything from uh, starting out on helicopters and moving all the way to VTOLs and ultimately uh, things like fixed wing aircraft in terms of the kinds of capabilities it can have. Uh, what we're specifically designed into is uh, their Vertex platform, as they call it. 
um, which is basically to be able to demonstrate and uh, prove out and validate these safety improvements and capabilities they have on these flights. And um, when they have, a, of course, a, a certain set of uh, program milestones and everything that they've been delivering that on. But basically, we are designed into uh, that platform and solution that they can then branch off into the different areas. So, uh, of course, aviation is kind of its own world and uh, has its own aspects to it that's a little bit different than the vehicle uh, platform side, but um, this is kind of the key first step and um, you know, we thought couldn't couldn't think of a, and find a better uh, player to be able to work with than uh, the largest aviation company. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question is from Gus Richard with Northland. Uh, yes, thanks for taking the question. I was hoping you could give a little bit of an update on your work with Mobileye at this point. Yep. So uh, that that that's certainly um, uh, certainly continuing. I think um, w w when it comes down to it, w one of the things that we mentioned is that we now have actually been deploying Iris uh, to multiple programs and, and customers uh, at this stage. So um, you know, and be careful not to not to comment on anything related to, to customer confidentiality, but. Uh, things are absolutely continuing full speed ahead, you know, with, with the programs, there's no um, sig otherwise significant update other than uh, we're now deploying this in a, in a more widespread capacity across the board with the key programs, the launch programs and customers and are going to continue uh, to deliver against the execution plan uh, leading up to the start of production dates of our various uh, programs that we've been designed into. Got it. And then in terms of production, um, you've got units coming off the line in Celestica and Mexico, um, you know, sort of what, what run rate are you at now? And are these, you know, considered B samples, you know, what, where are they in the maturation of the product? Right, right. So uh, as, as, as of today, you know, as we speak, it's literally, we, we actually just gotten things up and running, you know, with, with those guys and online. Uh, so a part, part of what we're, uh, we're building out is, you know, for, for a capacity kind of in the, you know, that would be capable of in the tens of thousands uh, of units annually per line uh, in terms of what we're building out in time, in terms of that. And then part of the advantage of working with folks like Celestica is that it's very scalable so that you can basically adjust the amount of lines that you need in a modular capacity to be able to fit uh, the dynamic nature of what this industry is and how this scales. So um, that that's, that's what the plan that we've been executing to. And this is really all leading up to um, you know, the start of production. Um, you know, before the end of next year. And that's where with these programs, we're working hand in hand. They're, they're coming in, auditing the facility, our process, and, and what we have to do in terms of this process transfer. But we've had that well underway. We're off to a great start, and we've proven that it actually works and the model works. And then um, what has been the, the customer um, interest in Sentinel, um, you know, uh, you know, how widespread is that? Is that, you know, half of the engagements, you know, can you give a little bit of a sense of how many customers are interested in just the sensor and how much want just perception and, and then the full stack? Yep, yep. So, so I'll say this, when it comes to the full stack, I would say 80% um, of the broader automotive ecosystem has to have some either, either Sentinel or, or some equivalent of this, if they actually want to be successful in deploying, you know, passenger vehicle autonomy and these kind of proactive safety capabilities. Because, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, uh, there really isn't, they, like most of them don't actually have the internal development capabilities and expertise and uh, know how to be able to really make this happen in the first place. And that was part of the inspiration. Um, so we, we've been continuing through the development process and engaging in uh, a number of conversations with, with all of these guys, uh, some of which we've already seen uh, start to be adopted. And we it's not actually an all for one either. Some automakers have um, certain software components that they've been that they've developed in house and then are taking it in a more a la carte offering. Um, our ultimate goal is to be able to make sure ensure widespread penetration of iris. Uh, but of course, there's also, um, you know, great economics with the, with the software as well. Um, so yeah, I would say for for um, I would say for some components of at least some components of Sentinel, uh, the majority of customers do have interest in this. Uh, and that's where uh, this is going to be leading up to our alpha release at the end of the year. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Eileen Smith with Bank of America. 
Good afternoon, guys. Um, I wanted to dig in a little bit on some of the recent series production wins, um, particularly with Airbus. At the time of Hong Kong Public, you guys were pretty focused on your product and your addressable market opportunity being at level three, four, highly autonomy, less so on the level four, five robo taxi market, and then even less so on non-automotive end markets like aerospace and defense and industrial. So what have your discussions with new and potential customers over the past few months informed you about future product direction and the relevancy of LIDAR and really where you want to focus? And is the emphasis still on level three plus systems for production vehicles or are the recent wins in any way indicative of the planned traction for highway autonomy being pushed out a little bit? Yeah. So, so when it comes to our core capabilities and what we're enabling, uh, nothing has changed there. You know, we're 100% focused on delivering highway autonomy, delivering proactive safety capabilities, you know, into uh, these core passenger vehicle production OEM programs. Um, that hasn't been slowing down. Um, but what has been accelerating as an opportunity for us to leverage um, is actually some of these other companies, in addition to the major OEMs that we see as major players that opportunistically can come up that we can be able to work with, um, to leverage the exact same product and all of the hundreds of millions of investment we've put into um, this, this technology and this business for our OEMs, uh, but, but for these other industries as well. And I think the expectation is still absolutely the same that the, the only, the way that you can build your business, you have to have series production OEMs that are gonna be driving that volume curve along with this. So it's really icing on the cake, you know, for these for these other uh, programs in, in terms of what, what we have and uh, what we're winning. Uh, for the right opportunity though, um, we're, we're, we're certainly not gonna say no to it and, uh, you know, vice versa, we're actually gonna work with these companies to be able to ensure that it's seen through. But, um, you know, we would maintain that uh, the time horizon, you know, for each of these different areas is different. I still actually firmly believe the uh, passenger vehicle OEM market is actually gonna be realizing the volume a lot more, significantly and sooner uh, than the robo taxi market um, that's had there. But um, the, the, the nice thing is, is that um, uh, it, it, it is still uh, an additional opportunity. And I, I don't, I don't want to make this sound like, you know, there's no potential for robo taxis over the long term. I actually, I'm, I'm still uh, bullish on that for like, you know, just, just le le less over the next handful of years in terms of, of volumes. We think it's going to ramp up more towards the end of the decade and really through the 2030s. Um, one other thing, and I, and I realize I want to make sure to address uh, one other part also that also relates to a previous question is that, you know, it, it, the question is, if, if something is lower volume, do you get higher ASPs? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, you know, there is a price volume curve associated with each of these things. So it does make a difference. Great, that, that's very helpful. Um, and then I wanted to understand a bit better the outsourcing strategy and the announcement around Celestica and Fabred. For the automotive layperson, can you describe for us what each of those partners are really bringing to the table? And so we understand it correctly, and apologies if this is a rudimentary question, is the manufacturing process separated at all between the two, or is it rather a setup of dual sourcing as would be pretty standard in the automotive industry? Yeah, so when it comes down to this, I mean, the reality is that this is an incredibly intensive process that we have to be able to streamline as much as possible. And we're, we've been building out and focus on building out the supply chain um, for this newly developed product. And uh, this isn't a commodity. This isn't a, you know, something that, that's existed for, for some time. So our, our whole plan has been to work with the best possible players, you know, in each of these respective areas in terms of what we can focus on. Um, for example, uh, with Fabernet, uh, the, these guys are historically known for building complex optical assemblies and, and doing so with precision optics incredibly well and doing so, um, taking it from uh, low volume into high volume, helping with, um, you know, manufacturability and work, working hand in hand with that. Um, and, th and that's been great. You know, they've been working with and collaborating with our team um, in Orlando from an advanced manufacturing perspective. And then equivalently with Celestica, uh, they're actually in charge of the uh, overall assembly of the LiDAR and the device, final assembly, pack out and ship. And that's what we've been able to leverage and, and, and outsource with those guys. So it all kind of fits to the broader picture and puzzle. Um, you know, could we take an approach where, for, for example, we also build it ourselves? You know, part of the plan in terms of what we have internally is we're actually defining the, the, the process, the capability, all the stuff that's really, really unique 
um, and, and stuff that relates to us. Um, but but what we don't plan to do is also build you know the full system and everything internally. Actually, these these partners exist uh, for a reason, and uh, you know, partner with us and do a great job out of this and in a very cost effective capacity. So uh, it just makes the most sense, and it's very modular. It's scalable. You know, they already have a lot of the capex there too. Um, so, that, but it's all about working with the right folks, getting the right arrangements in place, and um, setting up the supply chain right. And that's exactly what we've done. Great. And, and one last question, if I may. You touched upon this a little bit in terms of the hiring efforts of the company over the past few months. As you make a shift from a LIDAR hardware supplier to a LIDAR-led autonomous company, by your definition, um, are there any technology gaps that you see within the business that you would look to augment through acquisition? And how much of the talent and engineers that you've been hiring would you estimate are more responsible for industrialization and commercialization of your existing products versus responsible for new technology and product development? Yep, yep. Um, so I, I think I think we'll probably have mo mo more developments to speak to, you know, uh, uh, ne next quarter when it comes to uh, all of those things. But I think you asked a very good question on that. And uh, the answer is yes, there are other uh, aspects that aren't maybe as obvious when it comes to the full stack solution in terms of things that we may decide we may not want to specifically do every part of it, you know, in house. I mean, part of what we've done, for example, for the for the strategy uh, in working with folks like Zensact um, is that they're actually building a, a core module when it comes to uh, the planning controls, actuation, everything associated with with that part of the full stack solution and working with folks like that, that can spec out the designs of um, also certain, certain hardware components as well um, that go along with the holistic solution. But uh, we are continuing to onboard um, a significant number uh, and, and folks with engineering talent, um, as, as you noted, not just from a hardware standpoint, but also uh, significantly from a software standpoint as well. And uh, that's really driving this solution. Um, but we, yeah, we're, we're gonna be making our, our own set of, um, you know, for, for for certain aspects of it, of make versus buy decisions, so to say, uh, when, it, when it comes to this. But our, the important part is you start with the actual, the foundation that can enable all of these guys. Because again, you know, part of the whole point of, of this and kind of as it relates to your earlier question is, is um, that we're doing this to help enable automakers that can't actually, that don't have a path forward, that don't have a solution unless they can actually, um, source something more holistically. And we're really the only ones that can actually do that at this point. Um, so that's the focus to make sure that they can get enabled as well and uh, not get left behind in the autonomy race. Great, that's very helpful. Thanks for taking the questions. Our next question is from Ite Michaeli with City. Great, uh, thanks, good afternoon. Um, just I had four questions on um, the Airbus uh, agreement. Um, first, can you talk about the, the number of LIDARs per aircraft that you expect? Um, second, maybe talk about the competitive set and whether your architecture 1550 maybe is more suitable for uh, aviation applications. And then is there any software component uh, with that? And should we expect perhaps um, more R&D to support these types of programs? Yeah. Um... A few things there um, that are that are packed into it. So um, the first one, uh, when, when it comes down to it, for for a number of uh, the lidars, um, it, it really depends on the uh, on the actual vehicle and everything. You know, it's, is it is it uh, is it a helicopter where you're trying to be able to enable safe landing? Is it a VTOL uh, where you're trying to be able to get uh, 360 surroundings for urban air mobility? Uh, is it a fixed wing uh, aircraft? And um, yeah, you, you, get, you can see it uh, scenarios anywhere from uh, one to four sensor configurations for each of those different uh, modes of, of air transport. Um, but, uh, you know, depending on forward facing versus 360. Uh, but, but when it comes down to it, I think um, from a technology standpoint, uh, the answer is uh, yes, this is well suited to really, to, to things that require high performance systems. Um, there's going to be a lot of you know different adjacent market applications that can that can benefit from lower performance lidar systems and, and other things that, that are there. Uh, I mean, part of the whole point of what we've done is we've built to this incredibly stringent specification that what, of what's needed for automotive, in all of these different key areas that you have to get simultaneously. I mean, the obvious ones that sometimes people will we'll talk about is, is range and resolution, but there's like 10 other things that you have to do and you have to do them all very well simultaneously. And that's that's where we've kind of built our claim to fame. That's why we've uh, you know seen such adoption with the major OEMs 
um, in, in for series production programs. But uh, the, the, those benefits do apply into other industries, but um, folks like aviation require the utmost level of performance and safety, and that's exactly why, why it's well suited. Uh, 1550 is certainly a, a, a significant part of that, um, and, and kind of going back to the core architecture. Um, but the same principle applies to cars, of course, as well. Um, but, um, but yes, and then uh, lastly, from a software standpoint in addressing that question, um, the answer is yes, uh, some of our software is portable into other industries. Um, the full scope and set of software is not necessarily relevant. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, there, at least not yet, there aren't highways in the sky. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's really just kind of more, more general uh, autonomy. And uh, the most important things are like takeoff and landing. And you, you do need actually some level of perception on that too. So, so like you can't actually have applicability of um, the perception part of, of Sentinel um, when, when it comes to that. But um, I, I would say, uh the software more than anything is is focused on enabling oems um and the majority of which that don't actually otherwise have a solution um so kind of thinking um a number of moves ahead in this overall game i mean there's the guys that you know have, have set things up that that need a lidar today with this but then there's the guys that uh don't actually have a plan and that's what we're trying to optimize for Perfect. That, that's very helpful. And just as a follow up, going back to Sentinel, and you might have actually covered this, but are, are proactive safety and highway autonomy kind of two separate offerings? I Meaning, can, can an OEM uh, just just go with one? Maybe talk about the, the progress on on both, and, and maybe even the, the the cost range of how you see proactive versus highway autonomy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so they, they are they are two uh, different offerings um, that that are had there. So. Um, when it comes to the proactive safety capability. This is the kind of capability that we can see that can be in, in what automakers are asking from us that they'd want to ultimately have a vision of standardizing it across you know, the vehicles they make, of enabling a completely different level and capability uh, from a safety standard perspective, um, such that you know, we can go from starting to try and mitigating accidents and how they happen to actually just be preventing them in the first place. And this is a capability that we can offer at uh, very low cost as well to be able to make a standardization even more capable. At the same time, we don't want to give up on the margin for highway autonomy capability of why, why we have, like, for example, these dynamic pricing models and, and other, other things that are, that are set up um, to enable those, those kinds of things and uh, effectively as upgrade options uh, to the consumer. So um, that, that, that's really the vision in terms of what we put forth. Um, but we think proactive safety is going to be the thing when talking about um, by 2030 or you know, even 2040 of, of, of seeing this ultimately be a requirement you know, for vehicles and actually, uh, uh, you know, ch changing, um, I, you know, when, when we did the modeling can change the safety factor of the vehicle. Um, you know, people fight for like single digit percentage changes in, in, in safety, but this can be up to like seven X uh, in terms of those kinds of capabilities. So um, that's why we're really focused on it. It's a really overlooked area of the overall autonomy landscape. And it's something that really nobody has been doing or, or paying, paying attention to. It's just the legacy ADAS suppliers. Um, that, that do like camera radar stuff, but that's where we have to take it to the next level. And that's also an important aspect of it is the same hardware that enables proactive safety is the same stuff that enables highway autonomy. So you can do over the air upgrades, even after the fact, after you buy the car uh, to have those kinds of capabilities. And you know, you already see folks like, um, you know, obviously di different, different set of assisted driving capabilities, but you see the folks like the Teslas of this world that are already starting to do certain things like that. Um, which is smart. So, um, and then I'll, I'll let Tom comment on some of the economics and how we're seeing that in terms of the bigger picture. Sure. And and what we've said uh, historically, when you actually look at the content per vehicle, to borrow a word from the from the auto supply landscape for highway autonomy, and this is both the hardware and software. Uh, we think it's going to be on, on the order of magnitude of about $2,500 per vehicle for the passenger vehicle space. And then for proactive safety, probably somewhere on the order of magnitude of about $1,000 per uh, vehicle. And so from that perspective, that's how kind of we see the pricing opportunity between the hardware and software. And then clearly, as you move into the commercial truck, as well as into the robo taxi space, there you're talking about multiple sensors per vehicle. But on the passenger vehicle side, initially, we're seeing one uh, sensor per vehicle. That, that's all very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, still, still leave some good room for profit from the OEM too. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Our next question is from Richard Shannon with Craig Hallam. Sorry, I'm going to take off mute. Uh, thanks for taking my questions, guys. 
I want to follow up on one, uh, Austin. I'm not sure if I understood your, your response on the uh, Fabernet and Celestica uh, dynamics here, whether they're, they're doing exactly the same things or they're doing, uh, you know, passing one up to the other a subset. If you could just describe that more, more specifically, I just want to make sure I understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll dive into that next layer of detail. So, uh, so Fabernet, uh, they're basically doing the, um, uh, the transceiver uh, assembly. Uh, so, so basically some of the core optical components that go into it, uh, particular focus on the receiver. So they basically take the, uh, the ASIC, the chip um, that we make, uh, combine that with our indium gallium arsenide photodiode, uh, package that in, a, in an automotive grade, um, you know, and, and certified process and capacity. Uh, then that shipped off to Celestica in Mexico, uh, where that's integrated as part of the overall final assembly of the device and uh, then ultimately shipped off to the end OEM customer. So uh, it's, it's all part of the value stream that kind of fits in, into play. And there's um, ultimately more than, than Celestica and Fabernet, but those are kind of the two central players uh, with Celestica being um, the company that actually does the final assembly. Um, and we worked with them to be able to set up a t test uh, process, qualification and validation procedures, you know, for the actual LiDAR as it comes off the line. Um, so that's part of what you saw in the video there too, with some of the different targets being set up, calibration modes, and all those other things to be able to do so in an automated capacity. Is that, is that, does that make sense or kind of what you're looking for? It does. Um, I missed the, I, I got in a little bit late, so I missed the video early on. So that's probably what I, what I was missing there. So thanks for that. Uh, my second question was um, regarding the um, uh, comments about increasing the, uh, the order book uh, as you get into the next call. Is this specifically related to your two most recent deals, SEIC and Pony? And and not sure what what that adds to it, and so that takes a little bit of time to understand that. Or is this also maybe some deals that might be announced between now and the next call, or even or even um, um, you know customers and partnerships that have been announced even before those two that have just been announced this year? Yes, and and specifically what we're going to be planning to do at our next uh, earnings call is to update the guidance not only on the forward-looking order book that you just mentioned, but also the number of. Uh, major commercial wins that we expect for the year. And the latter drives the former. And so we've had, uh, as we mentioned earlier during the prepared remarks, a better pace of winning than we were expecting. And some of those wins have just happened recently. And so we're going to uh, develop a, uh, you know, s sit down and look at what we expect to happen between now uh, and, and the rest of the year. Uh, not only in terms of how many additional wins that we expect, but what that translates into for with regards to the order book growth, uh, and we'll provide that updated guidance at our next quarterly uh, call. So I think it encompasses a lot of what you just referenced. Okay, thanks for those specifics. Maybe one last question for me, Austin. These kind of big picture, long term, kind of talked about uh, two or three different markets here: passenger cars, trucking, and then robo taxis. Um, Kind of made a comment earlier to someone's question about the dynamics within robo taxis, but just kind of broadly speaking, in, in the last quarter since your since your last update, I guess about two months ago, what dynamics are you seeing here in terms of either acceleration or slowdown um, in the passenger car and trucking space? Particularly those things that are outside of your control, you know, outside of the perception stack. Are you seeing them pulled forward, pushed out, and if so, can you comment on those drivers? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so when it when it comes down to it, I think. This is where each OEM, of course, has their own their own program timeline. Generally, there's a lot of time in terms of the lead up, you know, to the actual start of production with with, with each of these guys. But I I don't think we've seen any kind of monumental wave or, or, or shift there when it when it comes to a couple months. We'd absolutely, um, you know, stand by the plans. And what we are seeing is the OEMs becoming even more and more invested uh, into seeing this through um, and potentially actually expanding it to more models of vehicles than even they were initially thinking, you know, beyond just some of the immediate, um, you know, top of the line uh, luxury vehicles. So, um, so that's kind of where we're, we're, we're in active review with, with all of these guys. Um, when it comes down to it, I, I think, um, you know, still bullish on uh, autonomous trucking as well. I, I think that's where uh, you, the highway autonomy capability and having that constrained use case is, is really important. Of course, uh, various players are at um, different stages, and I'd say the overall autonomous trucking space uh, is actually a little, it's a little bit behind the pass car space when it comes to just overall readiness um, to really get into production. Um, so so that's, that's going to be a bit of a different timeline there. 
Um, but I think over the long term, that's 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 bullish. And then over a little bit of a, a longer time horizon as well. I, I, I like I said, I, I, I just, I just want to make sure that you know we're, we're realistic on it, so that it's not a you know it's not a surprise. Um, and I'm talking just at the industry level, not just as it relates to us. You know, a few years from now, when mm-hmm. our, our robo taxi overlords aren't driving around everywhere, taking everybody between every city, you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna take it's gonna take time for this to proliferate. Um, but uh, but again, it, it, it is one of those. Um, incredibly valuable spaces that that is um, that does make a lot of sense. And then when it comes to software adoption, everything that's only accelerated for us. You know, ever since we announced Sentinel, we've seen a huge amount of interest. Um, and as was mentioned, not, not just from uh, from both our customers, but also again engaging folks that aren't our customers that can now become our customers because we have this holistic offering. So uh, that's where uh, we're, we're continuing to to do that, even even before um, the full software suite is ready. Appreciate those thoughts. That's all for me, Tom, and also thanks. And our last scholar is David Kelly from Jefferies. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for uh, squeezing me in here. Just a couple from my end, and, and maybe starting with uh, your recent announcements, SAIC, Pony AI. Uh, just hoping to get your thoughts on the China autonomous opportunity, maybe even high level as a region. I guess from our vantage point, it feels like the market is perhaps more focused on streamlining autonomous rollout. So curious as to how you think about adoption timelines in China versus the US and Europe. And, and then if the regional opportunity there and your strategy there has changed at all in the last few months, it'd be great. Yeah. So. Um... Our strategy has definitely gotten more aggressive over the past few months. I mean, we, we knew that we wanted to be able to uh, to launch big and bold, and that was uh, really the kickoff with SAIC uh, in terms of what, what we were able to do and pull off there. Um, that's, I, I think working with some of the key leading players you know, in, in China is going to be key. I, I think at the same time, um, what's tough is that um, just as with a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of noise, and I think there's actually like a surprising amount of noise you know, even within China. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how uh, the rest of that landscape plays out o- over the next uh, couple of years there. I, I think, um, you know, uh, people are moving very quickly, which is great. Uh, this stuff takes time, you know, for, for development, though. There really are no shortcuts. And um, I think the important part is, is is taking the high road and not trying to cut the corners when it comes to performance, when it comes to safety, when it comes to all of these things. Um, and uh, that, that, that's that's really what the uh, a lot of the top players are, are, are doing. And that's the whole point of, of why they've uh, tapped us to, to work with them uh, to solve exactly that, just like, you know, in, in the um, in Europe, in the U.S. here. So um, that, that's, that's continuing. I, I, we're, we're building out the Shanghai office um, and, and that's something that's really just starting here. Um, all this has kind of come together in the past few months. So uh, we're, we're having all this play out in real time, but um, this is uh, as good of a kickoff as we could hope for uh, for our operations in China. Okay, got it. That's super helpful. Thank you. And, and then maybe just as a, a last one here, Austin, you mentioned the recent uh, employee additions. I think you might've mentioned a hundred plus or so, a number of roles uh, there. Just hoping you could maybe frame that for us how that's tracking versus your prior expectations. And you know, if we have some visibility to the order book ramping here, you know, do we expect some more aggressive uptick here in the future? Yeah, so, so we are uh, absolutely aggressively uh, investing you know, into the overall team, into these programs. You know, of course, uh, each additional program that you take on provides huge opportunity, huge growth, huge everything. It does take you know, kind of incremental resources, of course, that you invest into it to be able to see that through. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, with, with, with all of our, our team, I think, uh, I, I think, I think if, you, um, if you ask anyone within, uh, within Luminar, you know, you'll probably get an answer of it's, it's kind of a miracle how we've pulled this off so efficiently uh, in terms of <laughs> going through the execution path. And this is where um, every, everyone's been uh, you know, cranking day in, day out you know, with um, uh, a relentless approach at, you know, in, in this maniacal focus at delivery and execution and all these different milestones that, that we have to hit at, you know, for uh, our core product and, and the customer milestones associated with each of this. Uh, so, you know, so that, that's, that's, that's been good. I, I, uh, the 100 folks is, is plus or minus, you know, in terms of according to the plan, uh, we remain on track uh, with regards to the overall 
uh, net spend uh, for the, over the course of the year. Um, but importantly, more than anything, and, and, and the team will always reiterate this, I'm always a huge fan. And it really, uh, I, I've, been, I've been fortunate enough to, to, to learn this uh, you know, earlier on of just uh, the quality of people and quality of leadership is just so much more important than the absolute quantity in terms of what, what you can do. Now, of course, you still need that to be able to drive. Like if you want to build uh, an auto grade product that actually meets all these specifications, even in a perfect world. It's still like you know a half a billion to a billion dollars worth of investment and years to, to actually do this and execute. But if you if you want to actually have a shot of seeing it through, you need to have those right team members in place, and it really makes all the difference with us. So um, you know we we, we did a, a recent um, highlight. We actually have a, a couple of the folks here in the room today with uh, you know Al as our uh, you know chief legal officer and uh, and Trey leading our investor relations, um, but. Uh, there's also a host of other new uh, great hires um, that, that we've had that are at you know, incredible skill sets and levels um, that I'm sure we'll have more to talk about too um, later for next quarter. All right, great. That's really helpful. Thanks again. Okay, and that was our last question from our analysts. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Um, this, is, this has been a hopefully helpful overview of, of everything and uh, kind of status update in terms of where things stand. Um, you know, I, I, re I really couldn't be more excited in terms of, of where, where we are and what we've been able to do. I, I think uh, the whole Luminar team would have been blown away if we if we had heard just a, just a year ago what we would be able to pull off and, and accomplish. And I, I think that um, uh, it, it, a big thank you to um, to the entire Luminar team in, in that respect of, of, of you know working day in day out to be able to make all of this stuff happen and uh, we're only just getting started so thanks everyone for joining we'll see you next time thanks Matt if you can close out the call.